Chapter eighteen of Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tige Hines. How Oliver passed his time in the improving society of his reputable friends. About noon next day, when the Dodger and Master Bates had gone out to pursue their customary avocations, Mr. Fagin took the opportunity of reading Oliver a long lecture on the crying sin of ingratitude, of which he clearly demonstrated he had been guilty, to no ordinary extent, in wilfully absenting himself from the society of his anxious friends, and still more in endeavouring to escape from them after so much trouble and expense had been incurred in his recovery. Mr. Fagin laid great stress on the fact of his having taken Oliver in, and cherished him when, without his timely aid, he might have perished with hunger, and he related the dismal and affecting history of a young lad whom, in his philanthropy, he had succoured under parallel circumstances, but who, proving unworthy of his confidence and evincing a desire to communicate with the police, had unfortunately come to be hanged at the Old Bailey one morning. Mr. Fagin did not seek to conceal his share in the catastrophe, but lamented with tears in his eyes that the wrong-headed and treacherous behaviour of the young person in question had rendered it necessary that he should become the victim of certain evidence for the crown, which, if it were not precisely true, was indispensably necessary for the safety of him, Mr. Fagin, and a few select friends. Mr. Fagin concluded by drawing a rather disagreeable picture of the discomforts of hanging, and with great friendliness and politeness of manner expressed his anxious hopes that he might never be obliged to submit Oliver Twist to that unpleasant operation. Little Oliver's blood ran cold as he listened to the Jew's words, and imperfectly comprehended the dark threats conveyed in them. That it was possible even for justice itself to confound the innocent with the guilty when they were in accidental companionship he already knew, and that deeply laid plans for the destruction of inconveniently knowing or over-communicative persons had been really devised and carried out by the Jew on more occasions than one he thought by no means unlikely when he recollected the general nature of the altercations between that gentleman and Mr. Sykes, which seemed to bear reference to some foregone conspiracy of the kind. As he glanced timidly up and met the Jew's searching look, he felt that his pale face and trembling limbs were neither unnoticed nor unrelished by that wary old gentleman. The Jew, smiling hideously, patted Oliver on the head, and said that if he kept himself quiet and applied himself to business, he saw they would be very good friends yet. Then, taking his hat and covering himself with an old patched greatcoat, he went out and locked the room door behind him. And so Oliver remained all that day, and for the greater part of many subsequent days, seeing nobody between early morning and midnight, and left during the long hours to commune with his own thoughts, which never failing to revert to his kind friends and the opinion they must long ago have formed of him, were sad indeed. After a lapse of a week or so, the Jew left the room door unlocked, and he was at liberty to wander about the house. It was a very dirty place. The rooms upstairs had great high wooden chimney-pieces and large doors, with panelled walls and cornices to the ceiling, which, although they were black with neglect and dust, were ornamented in various ways. From all of these tokens Oliver concluded that a long time ago, before the old Jew was born, it had belonged to better people, and had perhaps been quite gay and handsome, dismal and dreary as it looked now. Spiders had built their webs in the angles of the walls and ceiling, and sometimes when Oliver walked softly into a room, the mice would scamper across the floor and run back terrified to their holes. With these exceptions there was neither sight nor sound of any living thing, and often when it grew dark and he was tired of wandering from room to room, he would crouch in a corner of the passage by the street door to be as near living people as he could, and would remain there listening and counting the hours until the Jew or the boys returned. In all the rooms the mouldering shutters were fast closed, the bars which held them were screwed tight into the wood, the only light which was admitted stealing its way through round holes at the top, which made the rooms more gloomy and filled them with strange shadows. There was a back garret window with rusty bars outside which had no shutter, and out of this Oliver often gazed with a melancholy face for hours together. But nothing was to be descried from it but a confused and crowded mass of housetops, blackened chimneys, and gable ends. 
Sometimes, indeed, a grisly head might be seen peering over the parapet wall of a distant house, but it was quickly withdrawn again, and as the window of Oliver's observatory was nailed down and dimmed with the rain and smoke of years, it was as much as he could do to make out the forms of the different objects beyond, without making any attempt to be seen or heard, which he had as much chance of being as if he had lived inside the ball of St. Paul's Cathedral. One afternoon, the Dodger and Master Bates being engaged out that evening, the first-named young gentleman took it into his head to evince some anxiety regarding the decoration of his person. To do him justice, this was by no means an habitual weakness with him. And with this end and aim, he condescendingly commanded Oliver to assist him in his toilet straightway. Oliver was but too glad to make himself useful, too happy to have some faces, however bad, to look upon, too desirous to conciliate those about him when he could honestly do so, to throw any objection in the way of this proposal. So he at once expressed his readiness, and kneeling on the floor while the dodger sat upon the table so that he could take his foot in his lap, he applied himself to a process which Mr. Dawkins designated as japanning his trotter-cases. The phrase rendered into plain English signifieth cleaning his boots. Whether it was the sense of freedom and independence which a rational animal may be supposed to feel when he sits on a table, in an easy attitude, smoking a pipe, swinging one leg carelessly to and fro, and having his boots cleaned all the time, without even the past trouble of having taken them off, or the prospective misery of putting them on, to disturb his reflections, or whether it was the goodness of the tobacco that soothed the feelings of the dodger, or the mildness of the beer that mollified his thoughts, he was evidently tinctured for the nonce with a spice of romance and enthusiasm foreign to his general nature. He looked down on Oliver with a thoughtful countenance for a brief space, and then, raising his head and heaving a gentle sigh, said, half an abstraction and half to Master Bates, "'What a pity he isn't a prig!' "'Ah!' said Master Charlie Bates. "'He don't know what's good for him!' The Dodger sighed again and resumed his pipe, as did Charlie Bates. They both smoked for some seconds in silence. "'I suppose you don't even know what a prig is,' said the Dodger mournfully. "'I think I know that,' replied Oliver, looking up. "'It's a th—your uh, one, are you not?' inquired Oliver, checking himself. "'I am,' replied the Dodger. "'I'd scorn to be anything else.' Mr. Dawkins gave his hat a ferocious cock after delivering this sentiment and looked at Master Bates as if to denote that he would feel obliged by his saying anything to the contrary. "'I am,' repeated the Dodger. "'So's Charlie, so's Fagin, so's Sykes, so's Nancy, so's Bet. So we all are, down to the dog, and he's the downiest one of the lot.' "'And the least given to preaching,' added Charlie Bates. "'He wouldn't so much as bark in a witness-box for fear of committing himself. No, not if you tied him up in one and left him there without whittles for a fortnight,' said the Dodger. "'Not a bit of it,' observed Charlie. He's a rump dog. Don't he look fierce at any strange cove that laughs or sings when he's in company? pursued the Dodger. Won't he growl at all when he hears a fiddle playing? And don't he eat other dogs as ain't of his breed? Oh, no. He's a out and out Christian, said Charlie. This was merely intended as a tribute to the animal's abilities, but it was an appropriate remark in another sense if Master Bates had only known it for there are a good many ladies and gentlemen claiming to be out-and-out -out Christians between whom and Mr. Sykes' dog there exist strong and singular points of resemblance. "'Well, well,' said the Dodger, recurring to the point from which they had strayed, with that mindfulness of his profession which influenced all his proceedings. "'This hasn't got anything to do with young Green here.' "'No more it has,' said Charlie. "'Why don't you put yourself under Fagin, Oliver, and make your fortune out of hand?' added the Dodger, with a grin. "'And so be able to retire on your property and do the genteel, as I mean to, in the very next leap year before that ever comes, and the forty-second Tuesday in Trinity Week,' said Charlie Bates. "'I don't like it,' rejoined Oliver timidly. "'I wish they would let me go. I—I I would rather go.' "'And Fagin would rather not,' rejoined Charlie. Oliver knew this too well, but thinking it might be dangerous to express his feelings more openly, he only sighed and went on with his boot-cleaning. "'Go!' exclaimed the Dodger. "'Why, where's your spirit? Don't you take any pride out of yourself? Would you go and be dependent on your friends?' "'Oh, blow that!' said Master Bates, drawing two or three silk handkerchiefs from his pocket and tossing them into a cupboard. "'That's too mean, that is!' "'I couldn't do it,' said the Dodger, with an air of haughty disgust. 
you can leave your friends though said oliver with a half smile and let them be punished for what you did that rejoined the dodger with a wave of his pipe that was all out of consideration for fagin cos the traps know that we worked together and he might have got into trouble if we hadn't made our lucky that was the move wasn't it charley master bates nodded assent and would have spoken but the recollection of oliver's flight came so suddenly upon him that the smoke he was inhaling got entangled with a laugh and went up into his head and down into his throat and brought on a fit of coughing and stamping about five minutes long look here said the dodger drawing forth a handful of shillings and halfpence here's a jolly life what's the odds where it comes from here catch hold there's plenty more where they were took from you won't won't you oh you precious flat it's naughty ain't it oliver inquired charley bates he'll come to be scragged won't he i i don't know what that means replied oliver something in this way old feller said charley as he said it master bates caught up an end of his neckerchief and holding it erect in the air dropped his head on his shoulder and jerked a curious sound through his teeth thereby indicating by a lively pantomimic representation that scragging and hanging were one and the same thing that's what it means said charley look how he stares jack i never did see such prime company as that ere boy he'll be the death of me i know he will master charley bates having laughed heartily again resumed his pipe with tears in his eyes you've been brought up bad said the dodger surveying his boots with much satisfaction when oliver had polished them fagin will make something of you though or you'll be the first he ever had that turned out unprofitable you'd better begin at once for you'll come to the trade long before you think of it and you're only losing time oliver master bates backed this advice with sundry moral admonitions of his own which being exhausted he and his friend mr dawkins launched into a glowing description of the numerous pleasures incidental to the life they led interspersed with a variety of hints to oliver that the best thing he could do would be to secure fagin's favour without more delay by the means which they themselves had employed to gain it. "'And always put this in your pipe, Nolly,' said the dodger, as the Jew was heard unlocking the door above. "'If you don't take fogles and tickers—' "'What's the good of talking that way?' interposed Master Bates. "'He don't know what you mean.' "'If you don't take pocket-handkerchiefs and watches,' said the dodger, reducing his conversation to the level of Oliver's capacity, "'some other cove will, so that the cove that loses him will be all the worse.' and you'll be all the worse too and nobody half a hape at the better except the chaps what gets them and you've just as good a right to them as they have to be sure to be sure said the jew who had entered unseen by oliver it all lies in a nutshell my dear in a nutshell take the dodger's word for it <laughs> he understands the catechism of his trade the old man rubbed his hands gleefully together as he corroborated the dodger's reasoning in these terms, and chuckled with delight at his pupil's proficiency. The conversation proceeded no farther at this time, for the Jew had returned home accompanied by Miss Betsy, and a gentleman whom Oliver had never seen before, but who was accosted by the dodger as Tom Chitling, and who, having lingered on the stairs to exchange a few gallantries with the lady, now made his appearance. Mr. Chitling was older in years than the Dodger, having perhaps numbered eighteen winters, but there was a degree of deference in his deportment towards that young gentleman which seemed to indicate that he felt himself conscious of a slight inferiority in points of genius and professional acquirements. He had small twinkling eyes and a pock-marked face, wore a fur cap, a dark corduroy jacket, greasy fustian trousers, and an apron. His wardrobe was, in truth, rather out of repair but he excused himself to the company by stating that his time was out only an hour before and that in consequence of having worn the regimentals for six weeks past he had not been able to bestow any attention on his private clothes mr chipping added with strong marks of irritation that the new way of fumigating clothes up yonder was infernal unconstitutional for it burnt holes in them and there was no remedy against the county the same remark he considered to apply to the regulation mode of cutting the hair which he held to be decidedly unlawful mr chitling wound up his observations by stating that he had not touched a drop of anything for forty-two mortal long hard-working days and that he wished he might be busted if he weren't as dry as a lime basket where do you think the gentleman has come from oliver inquired the jew with a grin as the other boys put a bottle of spirits on the table I i don't know sir replied oliver 
"'Who's that?' inquired Tom Chitling, casting a contemptuous look at Oliver. "'A young friend of mine, my dear,' replied the Jew. "'He's in luck, then,' said the young man, with a meaning look at Fagin. "'Never mind where I come from, young un. You'll find your way there soon enough, I'll bet a crown.' At this sally the boys laughed. After some more jokes on the same subject, they exchanged a few short whispers with Fagin, and withdrew. After some words apart between the last comer and Fagin, they drew their chairs towards the fire, and the Jew, telling Oliver to come and sit by them, led the conversation to the topics most calculated to interest his hearers. These were the great advantages of the trade, the proficiency of the dodger, the amiability of Charlie Bates, and the liberality of the Jew himself. At length these subjects displayed signs of being thoroughly exhausted, and Mr. Chitling did the same, for the house of correction becomes fatiguing after a week or two. Miss Betsy accordingly withdrew, and left the party to their repose. From this day Oliver was seldom left alone, but was placed in almost constant communication with the two boys, who played the old game with the Jew every day, whether for their own improvement or Oliver's Mr. Fagin knew best. At other times the old man would tell them stories of robberies he had committed in his younger days, mixed up with so much that was droll and curious that Oliver could not help laughing heartily, and showing that he was amused in spite of all his better feelings. In short, the wily old Jew had the boy in his toils. Having prepared his mind by solitude and gloom to prefer any society to the companionship of his own sad thoughts in such a dreary place, he was now slowly instilling into his soul the poison which he hoped would blacken it and change its hue for ever. End of chapter 18